Whatever the final count of fatalities is in the United States from the COVID-19 pandemic, the cost is already far too high. This week's guest reminds us that there are still simple things that Americans can do to stay safe, to stay healthy, and to help fight the pandemic. He's Dr. Ashish Jha, this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Joining me as he does every week in the co-host chair is my great friend and colleague, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Each week we talk about big issues with great guests, storytellers, scholars, physicians, and more to make sense of the big issues shaping the United States today. This week we're joined by Ashish Jha, the new dean of the School of Public Health at Brown University and a widely respected and well-known public health scholar. Dr. Jha, thank you so much for being with us. Jim, thank you so much for having me on. So, you know, the, the big story obviously is, is the pandemic. And we're taping this in the middle of uh, September. Uh, about 194,000 Americans have, have, have died from this uh, infection, uh, more than 6 million uh, infected cases. Uh, where do you think we are and what do you think the next several months are going to look like for the United States? Yeah, so it's a good question. And, and when I look at where we are in September of 2020, I think of us, if this were a baseball game, Jim, I think of us as sort of at the top of the fifth inning, kind of getting to about the halfway mark uh, of the game. So why do I say that? Uh, I see this as about an 18-month pandemic. It started in January of this year. Uh, that's really when the world became aware of it. And while I don't expect life to go back to complete normal by the end of next June, I do think by the end of next June, things will feel meaningfully better. And so that's about 18 months. And so if we're marking 18 months, we're in month nine. Uh, so top of the top of the fifth. Uh, and, and another way to think about it is we have about as many days to go ahead of us as we have behind us. We still have a lot of work to do. We're not anywhere near the end of this thing. Do do when you say uh, you know halfway through in terms of time, what what you know? Some of the projections out of uh, the University of Washington are talking about four hundred thousand fatalities by uh, by the first of the year. Do you put any stock in those models? I think that's a that's pretty pessimistic. I understand uh, where those guys have come up with that. They're very good uh, scholars, and so I don't dismiss their projections lightly. Uh, we're, we are approaching 200,000 deaths and certainly would not be surprised if we have another 50 or 75,000 deaths uh, by the end of December. And it's worth taking stock. That is awful. Like 200,000 Americans have died from this pandemic. Uh, that is unbelievable. I don't think any of us expected that things would be this bad. So even if we don't hit that 400,000 number, I, I still feel like, uh, you know, I'm not celebrating here. There's a, there's a lot of suffering and a lot of death across our nation. Uh, that we have to acknowledge and, and deal with. A critical piece of this picture, obviously, in your 18-month scenario is a vaccine, and there are many vaccines being developed currently. Can you give us sort of an assessment? Again, we're in the middle of September, where things stand and, and where we might expect or when we might expect to see a safe and effective vaccine coming to, to the people of both the United States and the world. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, Wayne. And, and it's first worth taking stock that a typical vaccine takes five, 10 years uh, when things go well. Always worth a reminder that, you know, we're 30 plus years into the HIV pandemic uh, and we've never developed an effective vaccine. So it's not like these things are no brainers, but there's a lot about this virus we knew going in, partly because it's so closely related to the previous SARS virus. That gave us a leg up. And from all the things that we can see, this virus is relatively easy to build a vaccine against, which, by the way, should make us think about in the next pandemic, what if we get a virus that's not so easy to build a vaccine against? 
All of that said, we are making absolutely phenomenal progress. Uh, we've got, there are at least 100 vaccine candidates, about 20 of them in clinical trials, uh, between a half a dozen and dozen pretty far along, three in late stage clinical trials. Uh, I expect sometime around November, December, we're going to start getting the readouts from these clinical trials, and we will see, and I'm expecting that we'll find that many of them are pretty effective, and I'm obviously hoping that they're going to be safe. And let's say I'm right, and let's say my optimism is uh, comes to fruition, and by mid-November, late November, we say, okay, we've got one or two vaccines that look like they're good to go, and, and we might have an emergency use authorization. Still a long way between that and getting the vaccine out to people. We're going to have to make hundreds of millions of doses. Uh, some of that is already going. We're already starting to make some doses now. Uh, but hundreds of millions of doses out to hundreds of millions of people just in this country, huge logistical challenge, huge logistical challenge. So we're going to be well into 2021 before a majority of Americans start get, uh, majority of Americans get vaccinated. Are you yeah. concerned that there will be political pressure or there is already political pressure to have a vaccine before the election? I really do have that concern. And, and, and it's not just uh, coming from nowhere. We have seen political pressure applied by the White House on the FDA, on the CDC, uh, the way the FDA handled convalescent plasma. Uh, that was that was uh, atrocious. That's not the way it's supposed to work, uh, and and so many of us are worried. Now the good news is that the great scientists at the FDA they're still there, so if they get to look at the data and get to make the decision, I'll feel much more comfortable. Uh, if the president or his political appointees step in and override the views of the scientists, uh, which is a possibility, then obviously. Uh, I think American people are, are going to end up having a lot more questions than answers from any answer from any decision like that. Ashish, I'm wondering, you know, the United States, you know, would, do people would have you believe it's the wealthiest, richest, most powerful country on the planet. How did we wind up in this in this in this rough shape in the middle of this pandemic? Yeah, it's a very good question, Jim. And and you know, there are a couple of schools of thought on this. I mean, one is. It's you can point to the ways in which the CDC didn't perform the way we thought it was going to be. We you can point to the ways in which the FDA didn't. You can point to ways in which the private sector, while I think it's done a fabulous job, hasn't been able to do all the things that we might have hoped. But ultimately, to in my mind, this is about federal leadership. It's about the federal government not taking the virus seriously, uh, not marshaling the forces of the U.S. government, and not coordinating and marshaling the forces within the private sector, and relatively early on deciding that it was, I believe, for political or for some other set of reasons, that it was better to let the states all figure it out than to have the federal government really involved. And while states have a very important role to play in public health, in a global pandemic, you can't have every state fight this battle on its own. You can't have... Um, you know, just because a lot of the supply chains are national and international for products, you can't have every state on its own doing it. That's what we've seen. And, and some states have done a pretty good job and other states have really struggled. As, as you know, probably better than anyone, history has shown that there are pandemics on a quote unquote regular basis. This is not a one and out situation. Uh, why wasn't the United States prepared and indeed why wasn't the globe prepared this is not like it's a you know a new new game here or total surprise or you know aliens landed and like in, you know brought down some microbe right why i, I, I realize yeah. that's a big question but why yeah so let's i mean you know so it's interesting so after about five years ago um you know, i led an international commission that looked at the global response to the evil of uh, epidemic and both kind of what went wrong there and how could we better prepare. And the fundamental lessons out of that commission was that we knew another pandemic was going to come. It was going to be a real pandemic. Ebola ended up not being much of a pandemic, just a, a largely localized outbreak. And we said the world's got to get ready. And in fact, uh, a group of us, uh, many groups actually put together plans. Um, and the Obama administration, when it left office, 
left a the uh, pandemic a pandemic preparedness plan uh, within the White House within the office of the National Security Council, and ultimately the Trump administration decided that this wasn't a priority and they didn't see it as a real risk. I think that was a was a disastrous miscalculation. If that office had still existed, and they had some very good people in that office, Bush appointees, I mean, these are not politicals. These were Bush and Obama appointees were in that office in National Security Council. If they had still been there, they would have sounded the alarm early. And uh, I think we could have gotten off to a, a much stronger start. Uh, I have to tell you, Wayne, I got this wrong. I really, in January, I was not worried about the American response because I thought, Everybody knew this was coming. We've got a great public health infrastructure. We have great CDC. We're gonna we're gonna handle this pretty well. Uh, I, I don't know what to tell you, except I just got that way wrong. In another conversation, you told me uh, that you expect a pandemic sooner rather than later. Talk about that, and talk about how we can avoid the mistakes of of the past and getting ready for that next pandemic, which will come. It will come. Yeah. So, you know, I've often said that we are entering an age of pandemics. And the reason I say that uh, is because the world has changed in some very, very meaningful ways. We're seeing more disease outbreaks, uh, largely because of environmental changes, climate change, um, more uh, encroachment into uh, into animal habitats worth uh, knowing for your you know, viewers, that a vast majority of new diseases that uh, humans face are zoonotic in origin. They come from animals. And so we are having more and more zoonotic disease outbreaks among humans. And then the other big thing is because we're in a hyper-globalized world, diseases that start in one place end up everywhere very, very quickly, like this one did. So, you know, actually three years ago, I was giving an interview to the Time magazine. I talked about a pandemic that I was sure was coming within the next decade. And if you and I and all of us were talking three years ago, I would have said, it'll be a virus that will come from China uh, and it's probably gonna be an influenza virus. Turned out not an influenza virus, but this was completely predictable. And that all the factors that created that risk, none of them have gone away. So we're gonna see, uh, we might see an, a, a pandemic influenza like the way we did in 1918, we might see more coronaviruses. So the way we get ready for this is, first of all, we really do need clear leadership and communication to the American people about what's here. You can't downplay it. You can't act like it's not real. It doesn't work. Um, but the second is we've got a, we got lucky on this one that we knew a lot about a coronavirus like this, and we were able to ramp up both therapies and vaccines as quickly as we did. It doesn't feel like we got lucky as we're approaching 200,000 deaths, uh, but it could have been much worse. And so we have got to make sizable investments in our scientific infrastructure, um, getting ready for viruses that we may not have ever encountered. How do you build a vaccine against that? How do you build therapeutics against that? How do you build diagnostic tests? You know, it's taken us six months to build a testing infrastructure where people can get tested. And a lot of Americans still can't get a test when they need it. Uh, we can't take six months to build a testing infrastructure. It, it, so there's a lot of work to do for the next uh, before the next pandemic. But we got to get through this one first. Ashish, I, I wonder if you can reflect a little bit on how the American public has performed in this. Uh, you know, you, you're just walking around town. Sometimes you see people with masks on, not with masks on, social distancing, not social distancing. On, you know, on, on average, how do you think we've done as a society responding to this challenge? So I think a majority of Americans have done a very good job. Um, the problem is that there is a sizable minority uh, that is not following basic public health measures. But I have to tell you, Jim, I'm pretty sympathetic to people because two things. First of all, there's a lot of pandemic fatigue going around. People are getting tired of this. So I, I always, I understand that. But the second and an even bigger issue is there has been so much misinformation, such a deluge of misinformation. This constant, like it's nothing but the flu, only the elderly die as though somehow that's okay. Um, or, you know, that this is all a democratic hoax. And what happens is when you're inundated with that kind of information, you can understand why some people might think, well, 
maybe it's not so bad. Maybe it is overstated. And that helps, that makes it harder for people to constantly be wearing the mask, to constantly be doing social distancing, throw in the pandemic fatigue. I, I guess, you know, I, I, I understand why people end up where they end up. Um, obviously, I wish people would follow public health advice a bit more closely, it would make a big difference. But I also think from a policy point of view, we've got to counter that misinformation. And we need our leaders to counter that misinformation. Uh, and that has really not been happening. And that's where I get more frustrated with leaders who should know better. What about the role of the press in all of this? You know, I mean, the, 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 you know, we think about sort of from the local newspapers to the big cable news networks. Um, how do you think that they've done, on, again, on, on balance in covering this story? In general, I think journalists have done a really good job. Like they have identified and uh, a lot of uh, stuff that has gone on in the background. For a long time, we couldn't figure out why the White House was behaving the way they, way they were. You saw great investigative journalists that sorted all that out. Um, it, again, in general, I think journalists have done a very good job uh, reporting the data. There, there are a couple of places where I'm going to, uh, you know, maybe pick on journalism a little bit. One is, um, obviously, there's some groups of people in the media who uh, have you know, sort of promoted some of that misinformation. Some more on the right wing side of things uh, have uh, promoted a lot of the, you know, nothing worse than the flu kind of stuff that is so harmful. The, the one place that the bigger kind of broader journalistic community can sometimes fall into a trap, and I think it's really important that we all avoid that trap, is sometimes it starts feeling like a team sport. That if the president comes out and says something, then if you don't like the president, you don't support the president, then it often feels like the right thing to do is to contradict whatever the president said. And every once in a while, what the president says is true. And, you know, so the point is not to like when. So, for instance, on hydroxychloroquine, which was a disaster. And of course, the president was wrong about it. But immediately you saw I felt like I saw some like cheerleading against hydroxychloroquine. And my take was. I want it to work. Like, as a doctor, I would love it if it worked, right? And if the president gets credit for it, fine. I don't care. I just want a therapy that works. So the key here is to not turn the pandemic into a political team sport. There's only one side, and it's it's the human side. And we should all be on humanity against the virus, not Republican versus Democrat or Democrat versus Republican. Ashish, as we record this, as we speak today, this afternoon, there are wildfires burning out of control on the west coast of the United States. Yeah. And that brings us to climate change, which is another area of your great interest in, in, in great research. Talk about first how these fires are indicative or confirming or, or prove, maybe prove isn't the right word, that climate change is real and intensifying. And then talk about the impact climate change will have on this country and the world. And, and that's a large conversation too, but. Yeah. So, you know, what's interesting about climate change is that um, it, it's, so first of all, I mean, I know your listeners and viewers will know this. It, it's, it's real, it's happening, it's here. It's not something in the future. I tend to think of climate change as like smoking. Let me explain that analogy. It's a risk factor for all sorts of bad stuff. So if you smoke two packs a day and you have a heart attack, can I prove that that heart attack was caused by smoking? What I know is smoking is a massive risk factor for heart attacks, but it's almost what we also know is you got to stop smoking if you have a heart attack. Or if you have lung cancer, can I prove it was caused by smoking? It's a huge risk factor. So when I look at what's happening in the uh, in the western parts of the United States, can I say climate change caused that? No, what I can say is climate change is a massive risk factor for those kinds of events because of temperature, because of the way it changes moisture in the air and and the droughts that it has caused. It's there's a lot about climate change. What we're seeing with climate change is many more uh, wildfires, not just in the United States, but in other parts of the world. And, you know, what people will want to come back with was, well, there were wildfires before climate change. Sure. But nothing like this, right? And nothing with the intensity and with the frequency that we are seeing now. And it gets to that broader point of how climate is going to shape the health of humanity 
uh, for years and decades to come. Uh, we tend to think of climate change as just higher temperatures or higher sea levels. Actually, it's changing the uh, the habitat of vectors that carry diseases. So in lots of places, uh, mosquitoes that would not breed in certain areas are now in those areas. The fact that Zika came to the United States for the first time, I believe is a climate related phenomenon. Um, the fact that uh, you see, I mean, and there's some, some of it is really simple stuff, right? Like allergy season is much more intense and much longer now than it was 20 years ago. That's a climate related phenomenon. We're seeing more, more asthma, more strokes, more heart attacks because of warmer temperatures and the interaction with air pollution. Those are climate effects. So we've got to look much more broadly at what's happening to human society and connect the dots with climate change. They're right there in front of us. Um, we, we just haven't put those dots together. And a lot of what I'm trying to do is, is get the health community to realize that all these things that we're worried about, that, that climate change is, is a serious threat and risk factor underlying many, many of those things, including disease outbreaks and pandemics. Uh, Shish, you know, the, I, 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 you're, you're a wonderful communicator. You're a respected scholar. You're a practicing physician. Uh, you're a public health expert. Uh, do you ever feel like Cassandra? Uh, you know, the, 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 you know, prophet from uh, Greek mythology who always knew what was going to happen, but nobody would ever listen to her. Um, so I, I do think people uh, listen sometimes. Look, it's hard to uh, it's hard for people to always hear stuff they don't want to hear, um, and I get that. And you know, we're all prey to that, right? Like we all get advice that we're like, you, you know, I, I probably should exercise more. I hear that. I should exercise more. So there's a bit of a human element to all of this that we all we hear it. We can't always. Um, we can't always internalize it and act on it. Um, but from a policy point of view, I do think it's really important for all of us to speak uh, the truth, say what we think is, uh, is important. And I do believe over time, as I think about my career, I do believe there have been many times where policymakers have listened to science and evidence. Not always, not often as, as, as often as I would like, but it doesn't mean you give up, you keep going. I mean, I think about it clinically, yeah, I have lots of patients that I've taken care of over the years. I like that somebody comes in with a heart attack who continues smoking. My job, tell them to stop smoking. Yeah. Do they stop 100% of the times? Absolutely not. But do I give up and say, okay, I'm not doing it? No, I got to keep going. Keep, keep trying to tell what I think is the right thing. How does this country address the significant health disparities by socioeconomic status, by zip code, by race, by ethnicity? Again, a huge topic, but give us an overview of how we can address that because they are pronounced disparities and inequities. There are pronounced uh, disparities and inequities in our country and, and uh, the pandemic really brought it to light. Uh, the pandemic has uh, very substantially disproportionately affected uh, communities of color, uh, African-Americans in, in many parts of the country, Latinos in other parts, uh, Native Americans uh, uh, in in on the on the Native American reservations and elsewhere, so really profound and and large effects and and starts getting you to ask well why, what's going on, and it has to do with where do people live, and what kind of jobs do people have, and who has the option to zoom in to their office and who has to get in, get on a subway and and go because they are a essential worker, and then they end up being exposed to the virus. Um, what it has taught us, I think, is a few things, things that we should have known, but, you know, again, that got to keep learning the lessons. Um, one is that social factors matter immensely. Uh, and there are longstanding policies we have had in the United States, uh, really built on, on racism, and you've got to call it what it is, uh, that, you know, relegate, uh, for instance, Black Americans to certain neighborhoods uh, from redlining. Well, that has meant that it has very specific effects on people's health based on the air they breathe, the kind of job opportunities they have, uh, how they can build up wealth. So I think all those issues we've known about have really come to the forefront. And so to your question, Wayne, how do we actually begin to deal with it? Uh, we've got to start addressing some of those underlying issues. 
so yes, that means uh, addressing underlying uh, racism. Yes, it means addressing policies that perpetuate racist policies. Uh, and it means investing in social factors and social determinants uh, to help lift people out of those circumstances. Uh, it is not a problem we've gotten into easily and quickly. It's a long-standing one. It's going to take a long-standing approach to get into solutions. Uh, but I feel like th the country is ready to start tackling some of those things. And uh, and I'm ready to start putting my energy and effort into trying to tackle those well, well. Uh, Ashish, we've got about uh, 30 seconds, uh, a, little bit, a little bit more than 30, about 45 seconds left. But I'm curious, your new job as dean of the Brown University School of Public Health, tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, I'm super fired up about this job, Jim, I'll tell you. It, it, so Brown is a great university, old university, but brand new School of Public Health. We've only been around for about six, seven years. And uh, and what I heard from the president, from Chris Paxson, was a vision that she really wanted uh, to have a, a 21st century School of Public Health that worked on issues that were uh, global as well as local and was pretty committed to, to enabling that. And so... For me, this was not a job where I come in and preside over uh, a school of public health as dean. And it was an opportunity to take something that was very good and build it into a great world-class school of public health uh, that was both deeply engaged in Providence, deeply engaged in Rhode Island, but also was a true global brand. Uh, you get opportunities like that, I think, once in a lifetime. So that's what got me excited. Great community. Uh, a governor and, a, and, a, and a, a head of the Department of Health and others who are very committed to the health of the people of Rhode Island. So right political environment, right local leadership. Hopefully I won't screw it up and, and do something. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are, they are lucky to have you. We're thrilled to have you in Rhode Island. Uh, he's Dr. Ashish Shah uh, from the Brown University School of Public Health. That's all the time we have this week. But if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org where you can always catch up on previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square. Mm -hmm.